When you hear someone talk about the arcade, it's likely they'll recount games like House of the Dead, Virtual Cop, and Time Crisis. Not played with joysticks and buttons, but a replica of a gun. The tactile sensation of actually gripping a near true to life firearm and pulling a real feeling trigger to take out enemies added a whole new layer of immersion to these games. Of course, companies like Nintendo and Sega would come to adapt these formats to their own consoles, bringing us peripherals like the NES Zapper and Sega Light Phaser respectively. Many consoles throughout the years had their own version of a gun, but the Wii, paired with the sensor bar technology perfectly primed it for the medium. Just a year after its debut, they released the Wii Zapper, essentially a plastic shell that the Wii remote could be inserted into for a more realistic experience. Although we prefer the Nyko Perfect shot, with its handgun form feeling closer to the arcade experience. And all in all, it just feels cool. Which is what it's all about. Regardless, there were several games to scratch that shooting itch. Most notably the Call of Duty games, but there were actually spin-offs of Resident Evil and Dead Space released for the format as well. But honestly, I'd be surprised if anyone played any of those. Naturally, some arcade ports would make their way to the console. Like the game we're talking about today, Ghost Squad, which we apparently got from Blockbuster for the low low price of $9.99. In it, you play as a member of some secret anti-terrorist organization called the Ghost Squad. Now, you might think it's called the Ghost Squad, because because, well, it's a secret anti-terrorist organization. Emphasis on secret, but uh, no. It's an acronym for Global Humanitarian Operation and Special Tactics. Because as we all know, abbreviations are badass. So Ghost Squad is a pretty typical arcade shooter. It's on rails, so you don't control movement directly. It's done for you. It's just a matter of shooting the enemies that pop up. While there are armored variants, most only take one shot to kill, but can be shot up to three times to rack up more points. The game also rewards bonus points for well-placed headshots. When crosshairs appear over the enemy, that means they've locked onto you and will land a hit if you don't take them out, obviously causing your health to go down. If you lose enough health, it's game over. Which isn't that bad because you've got endless continues. That's right, no more draining your coffers of tokens or quarters or those debit card thingies that most arcades seem to have these days. Just the perk of getting the game on console, I guess. You've got infinite ammo, but have to reload by flicking your controller off screen. When it comes to the standard arcadey gameplay, it's as good as it gets. It's responsive, satisfying, and pretty darn fun. Of course, there's something to say about those repetitive death sounds. <laughs> <laughs> the run and gun gameplay is broken up by a few mini games and challenges that the player must overcome, like sniping enemies from a long distance, contending with weapon sway and having to reload after each shot, forcing the player to constantly reset their aim, or close quarter combat where you have to put the correct inputs on a target to defeat them. The levels also have a branching mission line that the game calls Tactical Decisions. These determine what you will and won't see and do in any given playthrough. In one mission, you have the decision of securing hostages or defusing a time bomb. In another, where you're trying to locate the president on a plane, you can choose to search in either the conference room or among the passenger seats, eliminating the terrorists while taking care not to hit the hostages caught in the crossfire. Ghost Squad has three levels which you can play in any order. The Grand Villa Rescue, Operation Air Force One, and the Jungle Break. In the Grand Villa rescues, the terrorists have taken over a government summit and have taken several hostages, the president being one of them. And we're gonna save them. Okay, look, I know we're trying to stay politically neutral with these names, but if I was gonna start a terrorist paramilitary organization, why would I name it the Indigo Wolves? That's lame. Why, I'd go with the Purple Gorillas, the Violet Tigers, the Magenta Caracals, whatever. So we're trying to get this guy named Alex Havoc. You've been surrounded. Release the hostages and surrender. It's Alright, I know I'm not supposed to side with the bad guys here, but you have this big buff guy holding the president hostage, surrounded by heavily armored, heavily armed men. You guys kind of are idiots. Then again, they're missing every shot with their fully automatic submachine guns, so I guess whatever. These guys must be getting supplied by China or something. So we chase this guy down, and he escapes out of this helicopter that apparently no one saw. Prepare for your end! Ignorant fools! Oh. 
Sure hope he has his pilot's license. In order to bring this guy down, you've gotta bring out this whole ass bazooka that we've apparently had this entire time, I guess. Oh yeah, bro time. In Operation Air Force One, the president has, yet again, been captured. This time on his presidential aircraft, and we gotta save him. He's being held hostage by this guy named Lacard Zimone. Drop your weapon. I thought I smelled rats. Eliminate them! A natural-born diplomat, to be sure. He then flees with the president in tow, covering his retreat with a bunch of soldier guys. We give chase, gunning them all down and making it to the cargo bay, just in time. And we're given just one shot to bring him down. Yeah, get out of here, Lacard Zimone. And take your obnoxiously Italian name with you. Are you all right, Mr. President? You saved my life again. Thank you. We just saved this guy from a terrorist cell and he gives us a freaking high five. What a bro. No wonder this guy got elected. Now we're on to the final mission, the jungle break, where the enemy is about to attack us intensely quickly take action and escape from enemy region. Here we're trying to save a guy named Steve McCoy, apparently the manager of some military company. He looks like a monkey. We save him, make our way out of the forest and into the river, and eventually get attacked again. Say, what was that about the Ghost Squad? Remember, you were the Ghost Squad. Don't leave any traces behind. Leave no trace. Well, we're currently putting a paramilitary's Air Force and Navy into the bottom of the sea. I think there's a trace being left here. Then we got this armored boat coming up, and the enemies are hiding behind these armor plates. In order to deal with them, we use our heavy machine gun and grenades to take down the shield, then take down the enemies beyond. Then it's just a matter of dealing with... Dingo. That's his name. And with that, it's all over. My favorite thing about the bosses is, you've got this grizzled army commando, you've got this tactical juggernaut, these badass looking dudes, right? Then you have this random Italian guy. Ciao. Beyond the branching pathways and somewhat campy presentation, the most interesting thing about Ghost Squad is its progression system. If you manage to successfully defeat the boss, you unlock a higher difficulty for that level, going from 1 to 16. Higher difficulty levels actually add more branching paths and minigames, leading to a variety of different challenges to be discovered and completed. For example, when you start playing, the Grand Villa begins with you simply breaching the door, but on subsequent playthroughs, you unlock a new option. You can go on the side to flank the enemy. After shooting your way around the villa's flank, you have to prevent enemy reinforcements from entering the building as your squad mates clear it out. Initially, Air Force One starts with you getting down to business, smoking the T's left and right, but eventually the game gives you the additional challenge of doing so undetected. Later on, you also unlock the option to assist the Secret Service by covering their escape from the terrorists. Thank you! In the jungle break, there comes a point where you can choose to move down into the jungle or go off on the side into the ruins. Both of these choices divide themselves further. Moving into the jungle gives you the option of either diffusing your way through a minefield or trying to move past the enemies discreetly. Meanwhile, moving into the ruins will give you a choice of clearing out the catacombs, shooting in a dark underground, trying to avoid shooting the hostages littered throughout, or clearing out the ruins above ground, leading to you eventually covering your teammates as they're surrounded by enemies. Those are just a few of the challenges and branching pathways that the game has to offer. In total, there's about 32. A lot of the fun from the game comes from discovering these challenges and trying them out. It really keeps you on your toes and it keeps the game from getting stale. You almost forget there's only three levels because the game manages to cram so much diversity within them. Of course, increasing the difficulty doesn't just give you more options. It actually makes the game harder as well. Enemies become faster, more accurate, and numerous, pouring out of every corner and bend and locking onto you with ruthless efficiency. The minigames become harder still, as the bar for success is set higher. You have less time to snipe enemies 
enemy, you have to save more hostages to beat the segment. The close quarter segments require additional input. The bosses are noticeably further away from the player, making them harder to fight. By level 16, the highest it goes, there is no margin for error. But I got what it takes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, crap. Hit him. Hit him. What is this crap? Oh, get out of the way. Oh, come on, get him, get him! Come on, come on! No, 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 please, please, no! Oh, oh my bad. Yes, sir, one shot, baby! Don't you know how to aim? Oh, screw you, the corn Simone! <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, if you want to beat this game on its highest difficulty level, you gotta know it like the back of your hand. And I'll say this, Ghost Squad is a game I could honestly see people playing over and over to eventually master it. I mean, by the time you've reached the highest difficulty level, you've been eased into it, and you've gotten to the point where it's not enough that you've seen everything the game has to offer, now you've gotta show it who's boss. Progression also entails leveling up your profile to unlock new ranks, costumes, and weapons. While the costumes are purely cosmetic and really just there for amusement, the weapons you unlock each have different playstyles. You have machine guns that allow for a quick rate of fire, shotguns have a higher spread, allowing you to kill several enemies at once but are largely ineffective at range and have a tendency to catch hostages in the crossfire if you're not careful. Sniper rifles have high damage output and can shoot through some material. The game calls this penetration capability and pistols are useless. They have a slow rate of fire, relatively low mag size, and they're a slog to use. Why they're in the game, I have no idea. Is that a light machine gun? <laughs> your ass is grass and I'm vegetarian. <laughs> Crap, it overheated. And believe it or not, this progression system isn't unique to the console port. Some arcade cabinets actually allowed you to scan an MOP card, short for Multiple Operation Program. Because once again, abbreviations are badass. You could get these at the front desk of an arcade and use them to store your progression. Hell, you could use it to put your high score on the internet, which they even have a website for. Whoa. Hmm. We're not sure if there's any arcade games that make use of specialized cards like that, so by all means, it's pretty interesting. There's also a party mode, which allows for the play of up to four players. It seems like a more competitive segment, where players kind of work together, but try to get the highest score out of everyone else. It's here where there's two additional modes, Ninja and Paradise. Ninja mode has you playing as a ninja, shooting throwing stars, as you can see, some of the models have been changed out. Alex Havoc turns into a samurai and he flies away on some sort of paper glider. Lacard Zimone looks like... this. And old Dingo rides on this fancy looking boat. Oh yeah, there's also giant frogs, both of the swimming and flying variety. Paradise Mode has you using this dolphin squirt gun and you're fighting off women in... swimwear. This mode was meant to be played with other people. <laughs> Dingo wears scuba gear, Alex Havoc looks like this, and this is the card Simone. Is that a tan line in the shape of a bra? Oh. Even though these modes get pretty stale after just a playthrough, it's pretty cool that it's in the game. Aside from that, there's a training mode that's meant to get you accustomed to aiming without a reticle. It's nothing much of note, just a handful of target practice exercises. There actually is an option to disable the player's crosshairs. Since the game has a really good sensor calibration system, this actually ends up being a really fun way to play the game. Having to actually aim down the gun makes the experience so much more immersive, even if we're missing the rear sights. So that's Ghost Squad, an overall pretty solid port. Although Though, of course, not without flaws. For one, the translations and voice acting can get a little spotty, but it's nothing too bad. While the weapon unlocks are appreciated, and a lot of them are fun to use, no doubt, the progression can feel a little nonsensical. You'd think you'd unlock the weak, underperforming weapons first, and they get better as you play through the game, but that's not really the case. It's kind of random. You'll unlock these weak, sluggish weapons at a point in the game where you really need those high-powered, quick-firing ones to keep up with the ramping challenge. Something probably more of note is that it is an arcade port, so it is, in turn, arcade. 
180. Each playthrough is about 30 minutes, sometimes less, of otherwise really simple gameplay that's gonna get repetitive if you play it back to back. That and there's only three levels. And sure, those levels have a lot of variation within them thanks to the aforementioned branching mission tree, but that doesn't change the fact that you're just playing the same three levels over and over. The game's at its best when you just kind of break it out every now and then. Maybe you're burned out from working on a project and you just need a quick, fun, high energy game to clear your mind. After all, there comes a point in every man's life where you just need to blast away at some freaking terrorists. And for that, it gets the job done. Ghost Squad is a pretty solid arcade port that stands out in the Wii's library. It does everything it needs to and nothing less. For that, I give it a 7.5 out of 10. Now, if you could find this game out in the wild, I would highly, highly recommend picking it up. We here at Genovision definitely think you can squeeze a lot of enjoyment out of it. I would especially recommend picking up a Nyko Perfect Shot to go along with it. Definitely better than the Wii Zapper. This weird, stockless, bullpup Tommy Gun feel just doesn't work. This does not feel like a real weapon. No one in the history of ever has held a gun like this. The Nyko Perfect Shot, sure, it's not the full-on submachine gun you'd find at the arcades, but it still recreates that arcade feel very well. That'll do it for this episode of Special Reserve. This has been Mac Chista from the Jetavision, signing out. You all have a good night. By the way, did you know that in Japan, the Wii Zapper was actually bundled with Ghost Squad? Yeah, they got the cool game. What did America get? A police training simulator set in Hyrule.